Hi everyone, welcome to this week's of the TechShift F9 podcast episode. I'm your host Maurizio, and this week I'm delighted on hosting Daniel Lim on the podcast. Daniel is the founder and CEO of Pixels, an innovative tech startup that focuses on fintech products uh, based out of Singapore, but spends a lot of his time uh, in Tokyo. Uh, Daniel, welcome to the podcast. Hi Maurizio, thanks for letting me on. Uh, great to see you again, and I uh, look forward to hearing what we can talk about this in on your podcast. Fabulous. Well, we'll talk about you. So hopefully that's a topic you know something about. <laughs> and uh, specifically, I try not to talk to about. My, sorry, I try not to talk about myself too much. Uh, you know, but I, I, I hope uh, it doesn't get too personal. <laughs> uh, we'll make you come out of your shell a little bit. Uh, so, Dana, we, in this podcast, we talk about career transformations, career pivots, uh, career paths. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've had a pretty interesting one, as far as I'm concerned. Of you graduated from Boston College. Uh, magna cum laude uh later on in your life with your master's degree you had the 4.0 gpa um which tells me you're a bit of a nerd which is fine uh, a geek <laughs> uh, very much of a geek i've heard you admit to that prior but what's interesting to me you started your career you're singaporean you started your career in singapore and early on, and tell me if i'm wrong but you sort of seem to be bouncing around different uh, jobs all in around uh, finance and technology. These were the two areas you studied, right? But unlike, I guess, a lot of uh, early uh, job situations coming out, you know, with someone with your strong economic background, you'd start off in a job, stay a few years, move on. You sort of hopped around a little bit in the early part of uh, in the early part of your career. C- can you walk us through what you were thinking about? What were your expectations? Some of the things that you encountered when you actually started working to make you uh, hop around a little bit. Yeah, I think um, a lot of people didn't realize this uh, about me. Uh, they assumed that um, I spent a lot of time as a trader, which was uh, the majority of my career. Uh, but I didn't start out um, working for the finance industry when I graduated. I didn't have the opportunity, even though I had really quite um, good um, academic results um, from graduation. Um, if you actually look back, a lot of people can't remember, but I graduated into SARS in um in into the Asia Pacific. So the prior right. to COVID um uh, respiratory diseases that was spreading throughout oh, of, uh, Asia Pacific, and so the economies were clearly quite bad. Um, and also people forgot that I graduated into a time where the tech industry just came out from the post two thousand Y two K bubble. So there wasn't actually a lot of jobs to go around. So what happened was an aspiration to stay and work in the U.S. never materialized. Uh, I came back to a country or region that was devastated by um, a covid light equivalent situation. And so I ended up, um, my first job was not in finance and not in technology. It was actually working for a logistics firm. And so I spent um, the rest of my careers charting a path, um, funnily enough, back to finance and then figuring out that I actually didn't like working in the finance industry <laughs> and then went on to found my own startup or or, or deal or, or work more with the technology part of uh, my education. So I think that's kind of it. So my career accumulates right now into, I think, uh, I think I'm on my eighth or ninth industry and I've uh, had many career paths in between yeah and let's dig into those a little bit but let's focus still a little bit on the early part i think you know i have you know sons who are uh at university they're going through a lot of questions about what to do with their lives their futures and i Mm -hmm. i really like the fact that you have a very clear path for yourself but you didn't get it right away for you know the situations that you just described Uh, what was in your mind back then to not just motivate you, but to give you a path into back into finance. I mean, what did you actually do to get yourself into the job or the industry that you thought you wanted to be in? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I guess um, it started out very difficult. And so I ended up um, learning a life lesson about being prepared and trying um, constantly. So um, just to try to get a job in the U.S., I think I pumped out 300 resumes 
I went through 50 interviews and they were all failures, right? They were all failures. So I came back, tail between my legs. So, and I gave myself a timeline. Uh, I think I told my parents, like, if we didn't X amount of time, we couldn't get a job, I will take the, you know, the first one that comes along. And that, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about where I was working or what I was working on and just worry about trying to improve or learn from or to execute the current job that I had to the best of my abilities. And I did that for the first, I think, two or three years after graduation. And then the frustration obviously grew. And then um, I promised, uh, I made a, I, I'm not to made a promise, but I actually got into a situation where I told myself I'll try to take a year off to find what, or to, to chart the path towards what I want to do. And during that time as well, I spent a lot of time interviewing with finance related firms and trying to get involved in that. So funnily enough, the finance part of the career came about by happenance, right? And this All is right. just a function of just being prepared, right? Um, I wanted to be a banker. I ended up being a trader. That's not a path that I knew about or I wanted to do. When I came out from college, um, I pretty much wanted to be a banker. And, you know, it was so-called sexy and glamorous to be a banker back then. And then I'm being a, a trader. And then the value of a trader grew in the prominence of the banks because banking, uh, because I don't know, Lord Blyfell and all these traders became the head of Goldman Sachs and all these other companies. And so trading became a more prominent aspect of um, the banking business or high finance. So I guess a lot of it is not about, or a lot of it I've realized is I can't plan any of this. Mm -hmm. I ended up just maximizing the opportunities that stood in front of me. So I think the reason why I went from job to job was that um, I maximized and extracted um, all the things I could learn from that job. And then when I was just putting my resumes out there, people found my profile interesting and started interviewing me and figuring out that I could do other stuff. So my skill sets were became more transferable because I was learning um, skills that actually could move from or could be used in one job and another. So classic example is even though I ended up in trading, um, working for the likes of, you know, JP Morgan doing that, um, I ended up helping them or was the liaison between the IT department or the or the programming department and the trading trading desk to build new a new set of trading tools for the traders because of my background. Yeah. Right. I mean it life is always being at the right place in the right time, I suppose, generally, right? But I think you gotta put yourself as close as possible to that nexus of events or situations or, or, or positions. But uh, I wonder in this early part of your career, uh, you sent you you said you sent out a bunch of uh, resumes and people appreciated the diversity of your skills and experience. But how much networking, for example, played a part in helping you get to the next job or to the next step? Not much. I think um, I ended up. Um, so there's a few things I think that helped me get to where I got. A lot of people assume it's networks, and I think there are a good number of people that actually do get the job through networks. And I think now later in my career, I do have a good set of networks that can put me in a position to maximize. But actually, learning to build relationships was actually the key driver of it. It's like uh, learning to be a good person and to create opportunities um, through interacting with people. I think that was the true value of what I've learned in the earlier part of my career. So I can give an example how I Please. got my job at JP Morgan. Um, so I actually interviewed with JP Morgan because I started calling around and got put in touch or uh, I was looking for a job, I was so desperate to look for a job in finance that I was calling around brokerages, brokers, you know, um, OTC brokers. So I wanted to be a broker. And so I called two, I cold called two desks, um, um, two brokering desks in Singapore, of which one um, of them actually interviewed me 
And he told me straight in my face, and I still remember the guy's name. And if Peter Harvey is still doing the broke, the last time I, I, I was talking to him, he was still a broker. Um, he said, you're too smart for this. Uh, let me put you in contact with two companies. And so he got me to interview with the two companies that I eventually ended up working for. Uh, Hess oh. Trading Company, which is Hedco, and JP Morgan. And I didn't, I went for both interviews and I didn't get the job. And with the, and then I ended up working for JP Morgan, I think one and a half years later. And I ended up working for Hedco, I think four years later. Um, the reason why was that um, when I was put in touch with JP Morgan, the person who organized my meeting was actually this lady who was a secretary. And she was the nicest lady and I was very courteous to her and, you know, we joked around and we, um, we, we always, um, I was always, you know, I was always uh, nice and I was always um, professional with her and I always made it a point to tell her that, you know, I don't view her as my superior or my underling. I just view her as a human being, right, in the way that we interacted. And so even though I spoke to the two traders that was running the desk. Eventually, those two traders no longer work for JP Morgan. Right. But a year or two into my career at Goldman, um, I needed to come back to Singapore because I was working at Hong Kong in Hong Kong for Goldman Sachs, and I wanted to work in Singapore because my then girlfriend, now wife, lived in Singapore. And we tried to get her a job in Hong Kong. It failed. So, you know, I was thinking, oh, maybe I want to move back. So I just popped an email back to the same secretary going, Hey, remember I talked to you like two years ago, one and a half years ago. Um, are you guys still looking for junior traders on the desk? Because, you know, I really want to do this. She goes, wow, thanks for coming back. I remember you, blah, blah, blah. By the way, we have a new MD. He's very interested, looking for interesting profiles. I think yours would fit. And she put my resume to the MD. And I interviewed with him and I got the job. Fabulous. I love so, the story. So it's not about your network. It's about how you treat people that you meet along the way, how you put yourself in a position to to always maximize every opportunity you get, right? Totally. And once you learn to be always prepared, you know, that always helps. So I think a lot, and that helps with what we're doing in the startup or what we're here doing in the startup is that I have this mantra, it's like, it doesn't matter whether or not there's an opportunity yet, just be prepared for it. Because I think one of the things that people associate luck with is that, oh, you're so lucky, Daniel, you got all these breaks in your life. And my answer back to a lot of people is, no, everyone, I believe everyone has the same amount of opportunities. The difference was that I was always prepared so when a door presented itself, I could actually run through it. Whereas a lot of people, when presented with the opportunity, wasn't prepared for the opportunity. Therefore, they can't take, you know, they can't take advantage of it. Therefore, they think they're unlucky. I think luck presents itself all the time. The question here is, can you, you know, capture or opportunize it to fit, you know, your outcomes? No, it's a, it's a great point. I think in terms of preparing yourself, it's not just about the talk. You got to walk the walk. You got to do the work. You got to be, I guess, uh, knowledgeable about the industry you want to enter into. People understand mm -hmm. you're not going to be an expert if you are outside, but you've got to show that you you're interested and you're capable of catching the correct, you know, the press points and the key points. So let's switch a little bit into your um, trading days. So you finally <laughs> got to be on a trading desk. It wasn't necessarily what you wanted to do originally. You wanted to be a banker, but it yep. is a fairly good position to be in. There's a little bit of prestige. There's a coolness factor. But how was the job? Yeah, it became how sexy for a while. Yes. <laughs> right, right. How was it being, uh, you were an oil trader uh, for, for yes. several years. How was that experience for you? I mean, did it live up to its expectations? How did you make the most of it? Or maybe you didn't. I mean... What was it like? Uh, it was it was good. I mean, it put me or gave me the opportunity to be quite financially stable for a long time. Uh, that I was helps. Doing it for yeah, that helps. I was doing it for ten years. Um, it 
became kind of a checkbox mark in my life. Um, like been there, done that, you know, did a lot of things in the younger days that I wouldn't have been given the opportunity to do um, at a very much earlier stage of my life. Um, set me up for kind of my, my career now and not just financially, but, you know, um, skill-wise, right? Because if you think about the trading job a little bit, like how, you know, um, a startup is, is that you try little positions on little ideas. And then when you work it, you in, you throw 100x more capital into it, right? So it's like a bit of try, repeat, reiterate. Oh, that works. You know, 100x the amount of capital you want to put into that kind of trade or that position. So, and then you learn to make an evaluation on a regular basis about the markets, um, how you think the market's going to go, how you want to express your views. Uh, it's like a startup, right? Look at the TAM or SAM or some of a market, find the problem that you're trying to solve and then find a way to express that view of how to solve that problem that is unique. Because in trading, you know, you can't earn um, capital returns if everyone does the same trade because the market becomes crowded. So you have to have a very unique way of solving that problem or expressing that view in terms. And that's kind of a startup. You can't go into a market that is a red sea. You tend to need to go into a market that is, uh, you know, a green field or a blue sea. And if you're going to go to a market that is already crowded, then you must really have a unique proposition. And I think that's, you know, similar to trading. And I'd add to that the fact that maybe a lot of people think the traders have vast amount of money and they can do whatever they want. Actually, that's not the case at all. Risk management is uh, very much dictating how much you can invest for how long. So you have a lot of restraints, just like in a startup where you have limited amount of capital to deploy. So I'm with yeah. you. I like that that, that similarity. Uh, and yeah, it is. What are some of the ways that you... I guess connected with the other people in in on a trading floor that you think are interesting or helpful rather for what you're doing these days because again I mean you tend to take uh to, or to have a fairly well defined type of people that work on a trading floor so I wonder how much of that is actually something that is uh moved on to your startup career which we'll talk about in a minute yeah I think um Trading is very interesting. Like people think that um, traders are all the same. Uh, I think that's where it's um, again. It goes back to the mantra of trading: is that you're always trying to find a unique proposition. Because if you have a unique proposition, then it's not a crowded trade, and therefore you know you could excel because you're the only one doing it that particular way. And so I think that's where personalities in trading become interesting. You see a lot of quirky personalities in trading. I think that comes from the fact that everybody is trying to find an edge and the people that survive the industry tend to have quirks and they're not your pro-typical trader. You have a bunch of them, 50% maybe, that are your pro-typical traders and then the other 50% are your quirky guys. They all have their little quirks <clears throat> because they have all have their little game, right? They know they play, they play the game a certain way that most of the people don't play that way because either they have a very special skill or they've created a very special system or they create a very special, unique way of addressing or expressing or getting their views out into the market. And therefore, because of the way they are, um, you don't need to essentially, it's, it's natural to them to be different. So that's what I learned um, when I'm hiring. I'm not looking for people that are very good at a particular job, especially in early stage startup. I'm looking for people that actually understand how to get things done. And I will overlook the quirks, right? Uh, and the reason why I'm willing to overlook the quirks is I understand that the quirks come with the required skill set to do a, a certain task or a certain part of, you know, or manage a certain part of the startup in a way that will make us different, unique, and not be worried about competitors because I have unique humans working for me that can give me a competitive advantage. So 
this is where I think it gets really interesting. Right? I mean, of course, as the startup grows, um, that could be a challenge because it doesn't fit into a corporate structure. But at the moment when it's still an early stage startup, it's actually useful and different. And that gives us, in my belief, an edge. And so um, I think that's where, you know, we could use that to our benefit. And Daniel, uh, tell us a little bit then how you went from being a energy trader to you know launching a number of businesses or being involved in a number of things and now focusing on uh, fintech and pixel. So, I, and again, it, not so much about the, the linear path perhaps or, or how you went about it, but I guess your interests on doing something different. What motivated that? How did you get yourselves? Uh, I guess refresh your skills, perhaps, uh, in in the on the tech part of the of your um, experience, which perhaps during your training days weren't as much used. Uh, so, how did that evolution happen? Yeah, so people didn't realize this. Um, I actually did use a lot of my computer science background in trading. Uh, okay. I built um, a lot of um, personal systems that helped me in trading to give me the speed or to give me an edge in the market. Um, um, sometimes I build it on myself. Sometimes I build it with the departments, uh, which is why I was actually tasked in JP to work with the IT department because I know how to build all this stuff of Excel at one point of time. And they're going like, wow, that's really cool what you did, you know, stuff, stuff like that. I think the point is um, I found myself in the later part of my life enjoying doing that kind of work a little bit more. Right. And so I you know, I think 20, 15 years out, out of college go like, I kind of want to learn about this world of analytics and big data and Python. Because I, you ask me to learn a new foreign language and I, I really suck at it, right? I've mentioned this to you, Mori, so I can't pick up another language. My brain doesn't work that way. Um, but if you ask me to pick up another programming language, I probably could do it in less than a month. Right. So I was like really curious and I'm a lazy seller. I don't like to be, I don't like to go online and read um, a few things. I'm quite visual. So I was like, you know, I have a small pad. I don't have to work for a couple of years. Um, let me go back to school and let the teachers or the lecturers teach me because I learn better when somebody's in front of me showing me how things are done. Right. So I went back to school to do data science and that's how I got my master's degree. Um, the school was very good to me. They even gave me a small scholarship, even though I, well, technically I needed the money because I was no longer working, right? But uh, gave me a small scholarship. <laughs> I ended up donating that money later. But then, you know, um, and then went on to do the work and I found myself enjoying it more and more and more, right? And also going back a little bit to my own background is I like to, you know, use my hands quite a bit. So... Most Singaporeans don't know how to do this, but I fix my own car. That is not anything that's not mechanical in my old car. I actually buy the parts myself. I know where to buy it from. And oh, I actually take my car apart and fix it. And I built my own computers. And so I just wanted something to do with my hands. And I wanted something to do with my technical background. And so slowly, surely enough, I just gravitated to whatever we're doing now through a, a series of paths. I think the businesses I started were more of trying to validate that I actually know how to run a business. You know, it's right. my little experiment to make sure that I didn't go out and ask people for money without actually knowing how to use my own money to run a very small business. Right. So I started I like a car leasing business and figured out that I actually know how to do this properly. So maybe I should try something bigger. Right. Um, my frustration when I started that company as well was that, oh, this business is really cool. I found this loophole. I'm taking advantage of it, but I can't grow this business beyond Singapore. So how do I find a bigger problem with a bigger loophole or with a small loophole but a bigger problem that is globally manageable and then try to solve that problem, right? And try to maximize all the skills. So it, it's more of like the journey to where I am as an entrepreneur was more of waiting out the time it takes for me to find the problem that would be able, I would be able to use my skill set on or checks the boxes of, of the criterias of what I wanted to do going forward. And so I think that's 
the the part about this startup that is interesting is that it fulfills those criteria and um, it could make use of the skill sets that I have. And Daniel, uh, there's so much to unpack there, but we'll have to keep it a little bit tight. Uh, in terms of your university experience when you went back to do your master's, I'm just curious, uh, mm-hmm. did you feel like the old guy in the room or how, how did you actually get yourself back into school mode? I was always a geek, so I always loved school. Um, I wasn't like that in high school, right? When I was much younger in high school, my GPA was like 1.7. I graduated, you know, (laughs) high school, or the equivalent of high school in Singapore with three Cs and a D, right, in my A-levels. So not exactly a star student. And then when I went back to university, but in Singapore, you have to do the army first and then go back to university. And so what really happened was during the time I was in the army, I, I, was, I, I saw a lot of people where, which I personally felt was not on par with my intelligence level, get ahead. And so I kind of became a geek, uh, you know, started to really care about school and knowledge. And I became very interested. And also because of the matric- matriculation system in colleges in the US where I went to school and now Obviously, it's been used even in Singapore. I get to pick the subject matter that I cared about so and to fulfill my curiosity. So I started taking subject matter and my curiosity. So people don't realize this, but I went to school trying to complete a finance degree, my undergraduate finance degree. I ended up completing a triple major in finance, economics, and computer science. Um, the economics and computer science bit was I just started taking classes in it because I was really interested in it. I want to satisfy my curiosity. And then I took enough classes to graduate with that as a major. So it's more of happenings. And so I started realizing in college in the US that actually what I really loved to do was in finance. It was actually um, mathematics or, or, or numerical economics stuff and computer science, which if you think about it, is data science today. So that's how I came about doing my master's was that I was just trying to scratch the same itch 15 years after college. So (laughs) um, yes, I was the oldest guy in the room most of the time, but I made really good friends of which one of them is my investors now. Uh, And uh, people don't, and we, 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 we had really fun because we were doing the work that we wanted to do. We were having good relationships and, you know, we were winning all the time, right? Because we were, you know, the thing about going back to school, doing a master's degree, it's it's a lot about competitions, not really competition, but friendly, you know, competition within the class um, because everybody has competing projects or competing work. Or in some classes, you were supposed to compete with each other because you guys are playing a game right. to essentially, you know, um, presenting and showing people like what you could do at, and people started, if you started doing well, your projects reflected well, then the good people start gravitating to you because they want to work with you because you do really interesting stuff. And then soon you, we, you know, you, you had this group of friends that, you know, really were like-minded. And I think that's something that was harder to find in college and easier to find during the master's degree. Got it. Uh, Daniel, we need to wrap this up. So last question for you. Um, sure. what's ahead uh, for you over the next few years with Big Souls and beyond? Um, so Tokyo is our fourth office. Uh, we've managed to get a very generous government grant, which I've mentioned to you before from the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, which is why we opened an office here. And this is why I'm spending so much time here instead of being home with my family in Singapore. Uh, and we have a lot more opportunities. And Japan, obviously, is a huge market. Um, we are having opportunities now in Europe and the US, and so we are hoping or uh, figuring out how to open our fifth and sixth office. Uh, we're going through a small fundraise right now, uh, talking to investors, but taking it slow because we just closed around last year, so we're not in a hurry. Uh, yeah, and hopefully more exciting things to do going forward and not go bust and go bankrupt. <laughs> Absolutely. Daniel, thank you so much for being on the show. Love talking to you. Thank you, Maritza. It's always fun to speak to you as usual. We should catch up for that beer. Absolutely. Cheers. Cheers. Well, folks, that's the end of another episode. Thank you for listening. 
Stay cool, stay positive, 